away for seven years and a lot of people still wonder why you didn't try to escape before you finally did escape three years mm -hmm. ago. When you look back on that, why do you think that is, Stephen? Well, there's, there's several reasons. I was told I was adopted. You believed it? Yes, I believed it. December 4th, 1972 was a Monday and little Stephen, a seven-year-old kind boy, was walking home from his school in Merced, California. His journey was interrupted when he was approached by an overly friendly man named Irvin Murphy. Murphy was handing out flyers to students, asking them if their families would like to donate anything to the church. Thoughtful and helpful as Stephen was, he told the man that his mother would probably have something to give to the charity. Promising to drop Stephen at his home and meet his mother, Murphy lured Stephen into a car. The driver's seat was already occupied by another man. His name was Kenneth Parnell. Stephen hopped in, hoping that the two men were taking him home to his mother. But little did he know, it was going to be a long time since he would ever see anyone from his family. Who abducted Stephen? Would he ever return home? Hello and welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved and twisted cases from around the world. Today we take a look into the tragic case of Stephen Stainer. The story of a young boy who emerged as a hero back in 1980. But the haunts of his trauma from the past lingered forever. But before we delve any further, please take a moment to show your support by subscribing to our channel, liking our videos, and clicking on that notification bell to receive the latest videos straight to your inbox. Without any further delay, let's dive right into the case. Merced is an old small farming town in the Central Valley of California, which is in the huge shadow of Yosemite. It's named after the Merced River and is also known as the Gateway to Yosemite. Surrounded by almond groves and peach orchards, it's one of the most beautiful places to live in Yosemite, offering a scenic valley, simple small-town lifestyle, and affordability. Back in the 1970s, Merced had a growing population and was one of the early modernizing cities in California. But this alluring place also had a catch. Safer than only 8% of U.S. neighborhoods, the chances of a person falling victim to a violent crime in Merced are 1 in 128. Lurking in the shadows of this beautiful town, there was a monster with prying eyes. And sadly, Stephen fell prey to him. Stephen Gregory Stainer was born on April 18, 1965, in a small city called Merced in California. Stephen had an older brother named Carrie and three sisters. He was the middle child amongst the five siblings, who were all brought up by their parents, Delbert and Kay Stainer. Stephen and his family lived on Betty Street, which was a common neighborhood for middle-class families in Merced. Stephen was described as a rather outgoing and helpful person who enjoyed the companies of others. He had an extrovert nature and a wholesome personality. Carrie, on the other hand, was more of a quiet and calm kind of a person who didn't shy away from being adventurous every now and then. Carrie was very protective of Stephen, and the two shared a unique bond. Carrie loved to spend time with Stephen, mostly either skateboarding or bicycling. Stephen's father, Delbert, worked as a mechanic at a peach cannery, while Kay, Stephen's mother, dedicated most of her time in raising the five children. Kay was described as an aloof woman who could be distant and cold at times. It was a slow, wintry afternoon on Monday, December 4th, 1972, when Stephen was on his way home after attending his regular classes at Charles Wright Elementary School, which was only half a mile away from his home in Merced, California. His walk home was heckled when a man named Irvin Edward Murphy approached him. Murphy was handing out religious flyers to students on the streets, asking them if their families would like to make any donations for the ones in need. He was seemingly friendly, slow-witted, and had learning difficulties. Pretending to work for the church, Murphy walked up to Stephen and asked him if his family had any items they could donate. Stephen thought his mother might want to donate something and told Murphy the same. At first, Stephen was reluctant. But taking advantage of Stephen's innocent and gullible nature, Murphy convinced Stephen to get into a car, promising that Murphy was going to take him home to his mother. When Stephen entered the car, a white Buick, he saw another man seated on the driver's seat. His name was Kenneth Eugene Parnell. Parnell and Murphy drove Stephen through the streets of Merced shortly before exiting onto a highway. Stephen watched as the car crossed the familiar areas of his town without realizing that it would be a long time before he would get to see his family again. On the very same evening, after waiting for hours, Stephen's family grew worried when he didn't return home. When there were no signs of his whereabouts after inquiring with the staff at school and Stephen's friends, 
his family informed the authorities and reported him missing. The detectives urgently got to work and started questioning Stephen's family and friends to find out if anyone knew anything about where Stephen could be. But nothing useful came out of those interviews. The investigation continued with each passing day, but there still wasn't a trace of Stephen anywhere. Flyers were printed out and put up throughout the city of Merced, and Stephen's flyers were printed and put up throughout the city of Merced, and Stephen's family tried their best to keep his case in the news. It happened here at this corner, and it was such a classic situation, the kind against which parents are constantly warning their children. The next morning, there was an empty desk in the second grade class at Charles Wright School. With the hopes of someone coming forward with any information which could lead the detectives to Stephen. As months passed and the investigation reached a dead end, Stephen's grieving family was left in sorrow with the hundreds of unanswered questions. After abducting Stephen, Parnell stopped the car on Highway 140 and pretended to call Stephen's parents on a payphone. He then returned and told Stephen that his parents wanted him to stay with Parnell for the night. This left Stephen confused, but he didn't know what to do. Parnell drove Stephen to an isolated rented cabin in Cathy's Valley in Manchester, California. The cabin was in the middle of nowhere, and there wasn't a soul around to be seen. Parnell told Stephen that he was now his legal guardian because his parents didn't want him anymore. He told him that they couldn't afford to raise him, and that's why they wanted him to stay with Parnell. From then onwards, Parnell started to brainwash Stephen and told him that he went to court and had gotten possession of him, implying that he was now Stephen's legal guardian. He even gave Stephen a new name, but allowed him to keep his middle one. Stephen was now known as Dennis Gregory Parnell. Parnell would go on to introduce Stephen as his son to other people. The very next morning, on December 5, 1972, Parnell committed the first of his countless acts on Stephen. As Parnell began his abuse acts, he excessively used a cough syrup to keep Stephen sedated. Stephen cried for help, only wishing to go back to his parents. But with no one around in the lonely area, his cries were lost in the distance. It was just the start of Parnell's manipulation of the young boy. The physical and mental abuse escalated over the first few weeks and became even more frequent over the years. Less than a month after his abduction, Stephen was enrolled in Steel Lane Elementary School in Santa Rosa, California. He attended under the name Dennis, with Parnell pretending to be his father. Over the next few years, Stephen and Parnell moved around California. Parnell had a series of menial jobs, and to anyone outside of the home he shared with Stephen, they were just a normal father and son. He even worked away at times, giving Stephen a full chance to escape, but he never did. By that time, Stephen had come to believe that he had nowhere else to go. Parnell even brought in a regular babysitter for Stephen for a while. She was a single mother named Barbara Mathias, who ended up moving in with them for nine months. Parnell kept Stephen under a spell and would manipulate him, maintaining a fine line between complete control and total freedom. He even brought Stephen a dog, a gesture most kids would think of as a gesture of genuine care. Parnell allowed Stephen to live without boundaries, allowing him to freely smoke and drink in his presence. Parnell thought that this would convince Stephen to remain loyal. But that wasn't the whole situation. Stephen had grown to live in fear of Parnell. Parnell told him to never speak of what goes on between them to anyone, and Stephen just knew that he couldn't. By 1980, Stephen was already 14 years old. He'd grown out of Parnell's sick preferential age, and hence Parnell wanted to abduct another child. He asked his friend Barbara to kidnap a child for him, but when she failed, he told Stephen to do the deed. But Stephen wasn't up for it. Even though he was threatened to try and get another boy for Parnell, Stephen would intentionally sabotage these kidnap attempts to prevent another child from going through what he had. And so, Parnell hatched a plan himself. Parnell bribed one of Stephen's teenage friends named Sean Poorman to help him kidnap a blonde boy he'd had his eye on in Ukiah, California. This time, it was a five-year-old boy named Timothy White. Parnell and Sean planned to lure the boy to the car, pretending that they needed assistance, but the boy was reluctant and said no. Timothy ran towards his home as Parnell shouted at Sean to get him. Sean chased the child until they reached a chain fence. Sean pried little Timothy's tiny fingers from the fence as he screamed in terror. He threw him into Parnell's car and they fled the scene. Timothy was taken not very far from his elementary school in Ukiah, California, which was about 200 miles from Merced. Timothy's parents were terrified. Despite the frenzied abduction, no one saw a thing. Appeals were broadcast, 
flyers were distributed and searches were launched, but Timothy was now gone. Just as he'd done seven years earlier, Parnell wasted no time in changing Timothy's appearance. He dyed the boy's hair brown and changed his clothes. He even renamed Timothy and began telling him the same lines he'd told Stephen all those years before. Timothy cried for his parents every day, but even this time, there was no one around. It had already been two weeks since Timothy was abducted by Parnell. Stephen made sure he was home early from school every day so that Parnell couldn't abduct the little boy like he'd done to him. But he knew he couldn't stop Parnell forever. Someday, the abuse would definitely begin. It was hearing Timothy being told the same things that made Stephen realize just how bad things were going to get. Stephen thought that if he didn't do anything now, Timothy would have the same fate as him. He was too young to be subjected to the horrors that would soon be unleashed upon him. He knew Timothy had a family that must be waiting for him, and he thought maybe he did too. This is what gave Stephen the courage to do something he never thought he could. Stephen cautiously planned out an escape plan. He wanted to get Timothy back to his family first and then try to return home, hoping that his family was still waiting for him. On Saturday, March 1st, 1980, Parnell was completing a night shift working as a security guard. It was only Stephen and Timothy in the cabin during that time. In the later hours of that night, Stephen and Timothy left the cabin together. Parnell's cabin was miles from anywhere, but somehow the two boys walked and hitched some 50 miles from Point Arena to Timothy's hometown in Ukiah, California. Timothy couldn't remember where he lived and no one was home at his babysitter's house, so Stephen looked up the address to the local police station and in the early hours of March 2nd, 1980, they walked there hand in hand. As they got to the police station, Stephen told Timothy to go inside and tell the policeman his name and where he'd been. He told them that they'd take him home to his parents. Timothy was frightened. He didn't want Stephen to leave and he ran back to him sobbing. By that point, a police officer approached them and Parnell's heinous crimes were exposed. In his complaint, Stephen wrote, My name is Stephen Stainer. I'm 14 years of age. I don't know my true birth date, but I used April 18th, 1965. I know my first name is Stephen. I'm pretty sure my last name is Stainer. And if I have a middle name, I don't know it. Seven long years ago, a youngster in California vanished. Everyone thought he was dead at this point. He'd rescued another boy. This is Stephen today. He is holding five-year-old Timothy White. Who could make this up? Every television network, every magazine cover. The news of Stephen and Timothy's return spread across the country like wildfire. Timothy was reunited with his family that night itself. And a few hours later, the now teenage Stephen Stainer was finally returning home to his family in Merced. Neighbors, well-wishers, gawkers, and the media crowded the street to witness and celebrate the joyous reunion on March 2, 1980. Delbert and Cave, Stephen's parents, couldn't hold back their emotions and burst out crying when they first laid eyes on him upon his return after all those years. Stephen, too, immediately recognized them, and the three huddled up together, holding each other soundly, not willing to let go anytime soon. Stephen admitted that it was hard for him to recognize any of his four siblings, as they didn't look anything like they did before. In the span of seven torturous years, Stephen went from being a victim to a hero. Within a few days of his return, Stephen was already being celebrated. It seemed that the whole of America, riveted by Stephen's story of capture and courage, rejoiced with him. Stephen, how does it feel to be home? Feels great. Did you remember your parents well? Um, they didn't change that much. Uh, I, I recognized them when I got out of the car. What about your brothers and sisters? Uh, they changed a lot. I never recognized either one of them. And now the Parnell's truth was out in the open the country was eagerly awaiting for his capture and conviction. As a trial would take place after his arrest, the police dug deep into Parnell's life. Kenneth Eugene Parnell was born on September 26, 1931 in Amarillo, Potter County, Texas, USA. During the early years of his life, Parnell's father abandoned the family. After that, Parnell moved to California with his mother where she opened a boarding house. At the age of only 14, Kenneth faced abuse by one of the tenants residing at the boarding house. Following this, enough had descended into him to lead him into a life filled with crime, including theft and public indecency. Parnell had problems from an early age. He spent years in and out of juvenile detention centers before serving five years in an adult prison for lewd and salacious behavior with a child. In 
Parnell had become a convicted sex offender. Sometime in 1951, a complaint was filed against Parnell for abusing an eight-year-old child. The psychologist believed that he needed help, and so he was sent to a hospital for a psychiatric assessment. Here he was diagnosed as being a psychopath. He was supposed to be held at the hospital for an indefinite period of time, but he managed to escape shortly after his treatment began. Five months later, he was captured and given a sentence of five years for the abuse and escape. In 1955, he was released on parole on the condition that he would seek counseling. But that same year, he violated his parole, which cost him another trip to prison. In 1960, he moved to Utah and was convicted of larceny, armed robbery, and impersonating a police officer. After being imprisoned again for seven years, Parnell was offered a release in 1967 on the condition that he would leave the state of Utah forever. He agreed and moved to California, where he befriended Irvin Edward Murphy. The two had met while working at Yosemite National Park. Those who knew Murphy described him as a simple-minded, naive, and trusting man. Over the years of their friendship, by 1972, Parnell had convinced Murphy that he was planning on becoming a minister and needed to abduct a young boy to raise in a religious-type deal. On Parnell's instruction, Murphy had been handing out religious flyers to young boys on their way home from school, and Stephen Stainer happened to be the boy who agreed to help. During the early morning hours of March 2, 1980, when Stephen and Timothy had already told their story to the authorities, Kenneth Parnell was arrested on suspicion of abducting both the children. Police realized that Parnell had previous convictions of sodomy, but he'd never been suspected of anything in California. The following summer, Kenneth Parnell was convicted of kidnapping Stephen Stainer and Timothy White. Over the course of the separate trials, Parnell's defense attorney stated that Stephen had the freedom to leave Parnell's cabin at any time, but he chose not to. They said that the kidnapping occurred before California's three-year statute of limitations, and therefore he could not be prosecuted for that offense. Prosecutors argued that Stephen was a psychological prisoner, and the kidnapping was a continuous event for the entire seven years. A psychologist testified that Parnell would switch between violent abuse and extraordinary freedom. Stephen was effectively brainwashed into thinking that he had no other option but to stay. He was coerced into believing that the life he had with his abuser was the only life he would ever have. He didn't know that his family still cared for him and was searching for him during those seven years. Cruelly, Parnell was sentenced to a mere seven years in prison for kidnapping Stephen and Timothy. He was sent to prison in February 1982, but was set free in five years due to good behavior. The assault and abuse the boys went through, particularly Stephen, was not part of the trial. And hence, he was not charged with the hundreds of assaults he committed against Stephen and other boys because they had occurred outside the jurisdiction of the Merced County Prosecutor and took place outside of the statute of limitations. The legislation surrounding kidnapping convictions changed after this case to ensure offenders serve consecutive sentences for each offense. Murphy, the vulnerable man Parnell had duped into assisting him, was convicted of kidnapping and served two years in jail. Barbara Mathias was never charged. She later told the authorities that she had no idea that Stephen, who she knew as Dennis, wasn't Parnell's real son. He and her son Lloyd played together. She claimed that Parnell even had a birth certificate for the boy. Sean Poorman, who assisted in the kidnapping of Timothy, was also convicted and sentenced to some time in a juvenile correctional facility. Stephen's post-captivity life was highly publicized. Stephen did multiple interviews. Television cameras followed him into his high school. The two-part miniseries, I Know My First Name is Stephen, released in 1989, generated a new wave of coverage trying to get the details of his captivity. But Parnell's hold on Stephen was such that the boy never revealed the full truth about his circumstances. Away for seven years, and a lot of people still wonder why you didn't try to escape before you finally did escape three years mm. ago. When you look back on that, why do you think that is, Stephen? Well, there's, there's several reasons. I was told I was adopted. You believed it? Yes, I believed it. At school, he was either nagged with personal questions or bullied about the abuse he'd suffered at Parnell's hands. Having been kept as a psychological prisoner for so long was already traumatic for him. The bullying and harassment he faced at school made Stephen's mental well-being take a toll on him. At Mendocino High School, he had a girlfriend named Lori McDonald who did help make Stephen's life a little better. This picture is just describes what he looked like. His personality, his hairdo, his flannel shirt, his smile. My name is Lori, and Steven Stainer was my boyfriend in high school. He had a great personality. 
He was spunky. You could see that he wanted to play and be with kids and be normal. But even then, the relentless attention was difficult for Stephen, and it became even more intolerable for him when sensitive information about the abuse he suffered at the hands of his captors spilled out. Stephen, what have these years been like for you, adjusting, getting over the seven years you were away from home? For seven years, I'd been uh, supposedly an only child. Now I had uh, to compete with a brother and three sisters. As details of the abuse came out in the media and at Parnell's trial, Stephen was called names. He didn't receive any psychological counseling. Back in those days, therapy was still seen as taboo. Stephen's father was adamant that his son didn't need counseling, even though Stephen was severely psychologically and physically affected by his kidnapping. After Stephen returned home, he was a very different person. He'd gone through immeasurable trauma. Initially, things were good, and he was trying to catch up with what he'd missed out on the last seven years. He dropped out of school after the other children teased him over the abuse he endured. At home, he and his parents argued over his attitude and lifestyle. Stephen had been given a free license to drink and smoke when he lived with his abuser, and those habits continued even when he was back home. Although his parents sympathized with him, knowing the mental torture he'd been through, as his parents, they couldn't allow him to continue with those bad habits. In one of the saddest indictments of just how low he was feeling, Stephen questioned if everyone would have been better off if he had never come back. Stephen ultimately resorted to consuming alcohol and drugs. Things got so bad that Stephen was eventually kicked out of the house by his dad. Once Stephen entered his early 20s, his life began to pick up. He got married to Jody Edmondson in 1985, had two kids, Ashley and Stephen Jr., and was training to become a security officer while working at a pizza shop. He worked with children and child abduction agencies, teaching them about stranger danger and how to keep safe. Stephen met his wife Jody while working at a butcher shop. In May 1989, a miniseries based on Stephen's experience was released by NBC. It was called I Know My First Name Is Stephen and received four Emmy Award nominations, including Best Miniseries. I know my first name is Stephen. Stephen was happy about the documentary's reception by the public. It was all facts and no rumors or made-up stories this time. It became a part of Stephen's healing process. But just when Stephen was coming close to recovering from his painful past and finally getting his life back together, yet another tragedy struck. On September 16, 1989, the night before the Emmys, Stephen was working at a pizza restaurant and he was eager to get home to his family. It was raining heavily and his boss offered him the company pickup truck to save him from getting wet. But instead, fearing he'd get in trouble for driving without a license, Stephen got onto his motorbike. On his way home, a car pulled out from a side road and collided into Stephen's motorbike. Stephen was driving below the speed limit, but he wasn't wearing a helmet. At the age of only 24, Stephen was pronounced dead at a local hospital less than an hour later, leaving behind a three-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. 500 people attended his funeral four days later in a church he joined not long before his death. One of his pallbearers was a now 14-year-old Timothy White. Stephen was buried in Merced Cemetery in Merced, California. The inscription on Stephen's casket read, Going Home. Stephen lived a short life filled with suffering and trauma. His life and death had an impact on others as well. Carrie, Stephen's brother, was born in 1961, four years before Stephen. He was 11 when Stephen went missing, 18 when he returned. He claimed he was placed under a lot of pressure to look after the family after the abduction and eventually went to stay with his uncle Jesse. A year later, Jesse was shot and killed in his home and the murderer was never found. It was suggested that he was jealous of the attention Stephen received after he returned home and committed the crimes to gain notoriety. In 1999, Carrie was convicted of killing four women at Yosemite National Park where he worked. Carrie testified in court to not knowing why he committed the murders and pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. His victims were Carol Sund, 42, her daughter Julie Sund, 15, Julie's friend Sylvina Peloso, 16, and a Yosemite Institute employee, Joie Ruth Armstrong, 26. He later came to be known as the Yosemite Park Killer. In 2002, he was sentenced to the death penalty and is currently on death row at San Quentin State Prison in California. The kidnappings exacted a heavy toll on the Stainer family. Delbert and Kay, Stephen and Carrie's parents, testified at Carrie's trial that they felt they neglected Carrie 
because they were always preoccupied with searching for Stephen. Carrie is very upset. I've heard stories about him going out and wishing a star that his brother would come home. Maybe he had some guilt because I believe he was supposed to have been with his brother. Timothy and Stephen shared a unique bond and kept in touch over the years. When Stephen died, Timothy was 14 years old, the same age Stephen was when they escaped from their abuser. He served as one of Stephen's palm bearers at the funeral. Because of what happened to Stephen, Timothy was determined to make a difference. He had a relatively normal life because of Sean's bravery. He became a deputy at the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department, got married and had two children. He became a policeman and would give numerous speeches about child safety. Timothy even forgave Sean Poorman, the teenager who kidnapped him. In 2004, he testified at Parnell's trial and helped put him away for good. Timothy lived in Pine Mountain, California with his wife Dina and two children. Unfortunately, on April 1, 2010, Timothy died suddenly from a pulmonary embolism. He was only 35 years old. He was buried in the town of Newhall, where he'd worked as a Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputy. After Parnell was released from the prison, he stayed under the radar. In January 2003, he tried to convince a nurse to kidnap a young boy for him for $500. The care worker notified the police, who carried out a sting operation to ensure a conviction. In 2004, Parnell was rightly sentenced to 25 years to life under California's three strikes laws for solicitation to commit a felony. He was 72 years old. Timothy White testified at his trial, and Stephen's earlier trial transcript was also read out to jurors. Parnell died in prison in January 2008 from natural causes, serving less than four years of his life sentence. Stephen's family had asked for a park to be named Stainer Park to honor him, but the council didn't accept this in fear that the community would associate the park with the other Stainer brother, Kerry, who was a convicted serial killer. But in 2010, a statue commemorating Stephen's bravery was unveiled in his hometown of Merced. It depicted a teenage Stephen, hand in hand with a five-year-old Timothy White, just as they'd been when they'd escaped their captor 30 years earlier. The statue was dedicated to Stephen's courage and to all the children who were missing, in hope that one day, they too can come home. Had Stephen still been alive, do you think he would have gotten over all the trauma that he faced? Even though Parnell himself had an abusive and neglectful past, do you think if he'd been given the right help, his later crimes could have been avoided? Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.